Hello, everyone. Good evening to those of you in Israel. Good afternoon and good morning to those of you based in the East Coast and the West Coast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sigalian Lee Feller. I'm the incoming director, executive director of JFN Israel, that I can say now publicly. The announcement went out yesterday. Thank you, Sherry. Um, but I'm also a lifelong environmentalist, and that's my first and foremost passion. Um, really along my life path. We're so happy to have all of you join us tonight for the second of the five-part series that we're running here um, on climate change. We're running this from the Green Funders Forum, which is one of JFN's peer interest groups, our largest peer interest group actually, that brings funders together around mutual fields of interest to learn and connect and collaborate and figure out what we could do to make a difference. I personally believe that as a humanity, we're facing the biggest challenge of our time, which is really climate change. As we all know, the world's leaders got together last week in Glasgow, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes, to try to cooperate and figure out a roadmap that will offer us a way to minimize the damage and figure out a way out of this. But I also think we as a philanthropic community can't afford not to be a part of this conversation and can't afford to sit from the side and not be a part of the solution as well. And that's really the motivation that brought me together with Gil and Marla to try to bring this issue to the front of the table of the Jewish philanthropic community through the Green Funders Forum and bring all of you knowledge, inspiration, ideas, um, and different opportunities that we can all get involved from the very small scale to a very big scale, each one in the scale and the relevance uh, to, in, to the level that's right for you. Um, I think we all care deeply about the environment and the world we live in, the way our life and the world is changing, and we're worried about what we'll leave behind us for the next generations. And that's really why we're here today, and I believe that it's time. It's time to act, and it's time to really do something about it. So I'm going to hand this over to Marla, my partner here in crime, who without her, I wouldn't be able to do this. Marla chairs with me the Green Funders Forum and is a driving force. And Marla, thank you, without funders like you, this issue wouldn't be constantly on the forefront of the table and you, you really make us, you challenge us at JFN and you make sure that we don't move this issue lower on the agenda. So thank you for pushing us to do this and I'm uh, handing it over to you. Thank you, Sigal. And I have to say there are many people in this audience that are have been extremely helpful as well and probably prefer at this point to not be named, but I think some of you know who's out there and we're looking forward to always having your help and being with us. Um, Seagal, we say that you are a renewable source of energy yourself, and it is a good opportunity to congratulate you as the newly appointed executive director of JFN Israel, and also many thanks to you and to Gil Yaakov, who is the consultant to the Green Funders Forum. It is a pleasure to work together as a team, and I am Marla, Marla Stein, the co-chair of the Green Funders Forum. And we really aim to be an address for you. Uh, we know that a lot of you are in different places in your journey in the environment. So whether the environment is one of your main funding streams or you're just interesting in dipping your toe and learning how to intersect with other things that you're interested in, we'd really like to be the resource for you. I feel like it helps my own philanthropy have greater impact. So please reach out to us and everybody um, is eligible for a free consultation session to help you figure out your own journey. And as Seagal said, the growing climate emergency presents a serious risk to the pursuit of all philanthropic aims. All aspects of society will be affected and all aspects are, of our philanthropy are effect, is affected as well. We really have no time to lose and we can really have a positive impact as donors and philanthropists. So we decided to devise a five, port, a five part mm -hmm. series to get members of the philanthropic community up to speed in this session, we will cover how the climate crisis intersects with other topics, and we'll be delighted if you can join us for the rest of this, all of the sessions, where there are four more, but each session will be standalone in its own right. And just to say that we are having this session right after the Glasgow Climate Summit and the very same day as the Environment Day in the Knesset, which was today. Um, our next session will be December 13th which will be about game-changing strategies to combat climate change. So be sure to register for that. Uh, we've put the registration link in the chat. And with that, today we have four guest speakers, starting with Dr. Dov Henin, 
who will give us a post Glasgow update and will also present to us President Herzog's climate cabinet and the plans for that. After Dove, we will hear from three additional speakers, each one focusing on the intersection of climate change with, an, uh, with a different issue area. Each speaker will be followed by short questions and answers. Please note your Q&A in the chat or your questions in the chat. Um, with that, we are honored to host the newly appointed chair of President Herzog's Climate Change Forum, uh, former member of Knesset, Dr. Dov Henin. Dov has a very rich and deep uh, CV, um, so I won't go through it all, but for now, I'll just say that Dov did his postdoctoral studies at Oxford University, where he researched the politics of the climate crisis. As a member of Knesset, he headed the environmental lobby for 13 years and passed dozens envir of environmental and social laws. Um, Dov, you are really an inspiration and a true mentor to all of us, and it really is amazing to have you here. Thank you so much. Welcome, Dov. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marla, and thank you, Sigal, and thank, thank you all for having us uh, and having the opportunity to discuss things with you. I would like to very briefly um, speak with you about the results of the Glasgow conference because there are many, many mistakes being done on this analysis. Uh, let me begin with the achievements. While in uh, uh, Paris 2015, uh, we were able uh, only to agree on a, a cl climatic goal of uh, keeping climate change under two degrees and preferably uh, doing an effort to keep within the one and a half degree um, climate change or rising the average temperature of um, our um, atmosphere. In Glasgow, there is an agreement about a concrete policy, not, you know, uh, not another um, science fiction ideas of new technologies that are not still in place, but a concrete policy uh, that uh, was agreed in Glasgow that we, humanity, should um, reduce our um, greenhouse uh, gases by 45% till 2030. Now, this agreement is actually an agreement about the biggest social and uh, economic change, the biggest social and economic endeavor that humanity ever posed be be before itself. This is a huge issue. Uh, of course, an agreement does not mean that uh, it will be fulfilled. But this was the agreement. And this is a very, very important uh, landmark. There are some, uh, more, uh, some additional specific agreements. Uh, 50, uh, 46 uh, countries committed to phase out of coal. In the general agreement, it is phasing down of coal, but uh, 46 uh, countries uh, committed to phasing out of coal. And there are many, many countries, including Israel, committed to reducing methane emissions by 30% um, by 2030. This is very, very much relevant to Israel because uh, it means uh, reducing emissions from waste and also from the uh, gas uh, drilling. Um, there are commitments to stop uh, deforestation uh, including, uh, by the way, Indonesia and Brazil. Uh, the rainforests uh, are especially important. Uh, so there are achievements. Now coming to the problems or to the challenges, the biggest problem is that there is a huge gap between the general agreement to uh, reduce our uh, greenhouse gases by 45% till 2030, there is a huge gap between that and the concrete commitments made by the countries. If we you know, um, use the commitments that the countries or the states 
made to 2050, then our um, a rise of temperature will be around 1.9 uh, uh, Celsius, which is not, not very good. It's above the one and a half percent we need. But we, if we, we refer to the shorter term, term commitments of all the countries involved, then the rise of average temperature will be 2.4 percent which is much above what we can afford. So there is a big gap between the general agreement and the concrete commitments made by the states. Now, the mechanism agreed in Glasgow to try to um, bridge this gap is a mechanism of um, yearly um, review of uh, the commitments ba made by the states in order to uh, bring the states closer to the general goal of 45% reductions in our emissions till 2030. And the next uh, review will be held in COP27, the next um, uh, international uh, convention, which will be held in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt uh, late in late uh, 2022. Um, this is the biggest challenge. This is the biggest problem. Of course, there are additional problems. The, the Chinese and the Russians did not move from their earlier commitments. The Chinese intend to uh, increase emissions till 2030. That is a very, very big issue, a very big problem yet. I personally estimate that uh, China, for instance, will have to act due to uh, the growing concern of uh, public health in China itself and uh, you know, the pollution that affects uh, Chinese uh, cities. Um, so um, there are huge challenges ahead of us. And where does Israel uh, stand on all this? Well, the uh, a state controller uh, published a very grim report about our situation. There is no Israeli plan to adapt to a, a climate crisis. There are only four designated staff workers out of 88,000 people working in, in government uh, agencies dealing with climate, climate issues. Israel sets in itself very, very low uh, goals and does not implement this goal, these goals. This is ever, uh, all this is the statement of the state controller. Um, in uh, Glasgow, Prime Minister Bennett uh, promised that Israel will uh, reach um, net zero emissions by 2050, which is good, uh, but, uh, regarding 2030, the goal the uh, Israeli government puts is only uh, to uh, re reduce emissions by 27%, which is very, very low comparing to other uh, developed uh, countries. Now, uh, Israel is, is a small part of the problem but it can be and should be very, very important part in the solution. We have in innovative uh, abilities, both in social issues and in technology, and we can be a very, very important part of the solution. That, and that is the challenge we face. We face, of course, the challenge of bridging the gap between our own very, very limited goal to uh, 2030, and the challenges and the general goals that humanity uh, pose uh, in, in the Glasgow uh, Pact. A um, few words about the initiative of the president, President Herzog. Uh, as you know, President Herzog uh, said in his inauguration speech in the Knesset that he intends to deal with climate crisis. In Israel, the president is not the American president. He's, he does not have the huge um, powers that American president uh, has. He's not the Knesset, he cannot legislate, he's not the government, he cannot you know, decide upon policies. What he can do, 
he can convene decision makers from um, top enchilance of the government, of the Knesset, and made them um, um, meet with people who are in, in the forefront of dealing with climate crisis, both understand the problems and uh, can um, uh, invent and uh, offer solutions. And this is the idea of the Climate Forum, and I'm honored to um, take this challenge and to uh, try to open the eyes, ears, and the heads of decision makers in Israel to the challenges we face. Now, very, very last few words about your role as a philanthropic community. I think that you, you are very, very important in all this uh, effort. The, the whole world is racing to uh, solutions um, and beyond technologies, social and economic models are desperately needed. Um, and they can come from a small place like Israel with our uh, innovative uh, spirits. And um, while the whole world strives for alternatives, uh, Israeli society, a very, very dense place with many, many uh, um, uh, environmental challenges, we have our own incentives to think about solutions for the densed world uh, solutions that can be embraced by others. So Israel can be a lab for solutions, both social, economic, and technologic. And um, your impact in, in helping us doing this is very, very essential, not only for Israel and Israelis, but hopefully for our contribution to the world at large. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doa. Um, first of all, I'm reminding everyone, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the chat. You can put them directly to me or put them in the public sphere and we'll read them out. Um, Dov, I'm starting with the first question that we have here. As someone who's already, I think, been in every possible sector, always operating on behalf of social issues and environmental issues. You've been an active and leader part of the civil society. You've been a part of the academia. You've been in the government. Now you're at president's, um, at the president's house. You've really 360 have been in every, and of course a citizen of the country. Um, so you're from every possible aspect. How do you, with the challenge of affecting public opinion, that's A and B, transferring the knowledge or awareness on behalf of public opinion to behavioral change. I think that's if you, the essence of what really needs to happen um, from the micro level of an individual to the macro level of governments. What is it that we're doing wrong or what could we be doing differently at this very critical you know, window of opportunity and time to change the course of where climate change is taking us? What is your take on this? You've really looked at it from every possible angle. So what are we missing? Well, I think that most Israelis understand that there is a problem there. You know, climate crisis is a problem. And I think that we should not focus anymore on explaining the problem. We should focus on um, giving solutions and ideas and alternatives to people because many people say, well, this is a huge problem, uh, but I cannot do anything about it. You know, it's much bigger than Israel, much bigger than me. What can I do? Uh, and this is the message we should fight, you know, because people should realize that there are solutions, that Israel is very, very important because we can be a lab for many, many other places. And that solutions for climate issues can also improve the daily lives of people in Israel. For example, in, in speaking about transportation, we all rely on private cars, pollution, and, and, and green, greenhouse uh, gases. But uh, private cars in Israel is also uh, traffic jams, and people are stuck everywhere in, in every in every place. So if we uh, invent or uh, imply a system of clean 
public transportation, this can relieve, relieve us not only from um, uh, pollution and uh, green, greenhouse emissions, but it can um, give us free time, you know, because we will not spend all the time in, in stuck in in, um, in traffic jams. Speaking about energy, if we, you know, um, um, uh, get uh, solar energy, it's uh, of course cleaner, but it is also cheaper and it's uh, more secure. We will not be dependent on 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 gas coming from you know this uh, huge um, installation in the sea so for a country like israel uh, solar energy is many 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 advantages economic wise security wise and also climate wise so if we connect all this all our solutions to everyday issues that uh, worry people uh, people in israel we will be able to mobilize them to the change we need. Thank you. I think that's partially what, what we are hoping to do here also at the session today. I have a couple of more questions that were posed here in the chat. Some of it you just touched, but tell me if you have an elaboration. How can Israel bring the benefits of solar power as well as green jobs for Israeli Arabs, especially the Bedouin community in the Negev? And what is the role of the philanthropic community to help make that happen? Well, I you are the first uh, person here to, uh, that can explain us that this very neglected place called the Northern Desert, uh, Negev with the uh, unrecognized uh, Bedouin villages can be turned into a, some kind of Silicon Valley of solar energy in Israel. And this can benefit the Bedouins and it can benefit Israel at large and it can create a solution from the most neglected part of Israel and that exists. So again, it is a solution for many, many problems. Okay, thank you. Another related question. Israel cannot be a solution without solving the regional issues. Water crisis will destabilize Israel's neighbors, neighbor and cause security crisis. How can Israel be a partner and exporter of solutions? Well, I think this is a very, very important issue. And first of all, we should, you know, understand that in a climate crisis, we cannot uh, continue to think about Israel as, a, a, you know, a, an island very isolated from everything else happening around us. First of all, we should understand that climate crisis is also a very, very big security issue. And um, I'm I can tell you that uh, people in Israel and high ranking uh, people in security establishment in Israel are beginning to understand that. And I'm very much involved in these discussions. Uh, but the other side is that in order to deal with climate crisis, we should find new ways of cooperation. Let me give you one example. At, at, at this moment, we provide Jordan which suffers from very, very severe water shortage, we provide Jordan with water. That is great. But we can also get energy from uh, the Jordanian desert because this is a great place to create solar energy. So um, such a cooperation is very, very natural and it is very, very much in the interest of both us Israelis and our Jordanian neighbors. And so it is a complexity that we, sh we should deal as, as some kind of a whole, dealing with climate crisis and issues and dealing with the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict and Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We should deal with this as a mixture. Amen, thank you. Okay, one last question and one last statement. First of all, here is sharing with us, it's time to initiate a public campaign similar to an elections campaign to place the issue on the public discourse on a continuous basis. Unless there is a public outcry, nothing will happen. And uh, so I'm not sure if you want to relate to that. Uh, totally, totally correct. You know, uh, uh, politicians in Israel are very responsive to public pressure especially in issues like this. And I think that public engagement is the key to a real change in Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis climate crisis. Great, so that's also something to think about as a philanthropic community, because that's definitely 
an outcome that philanthropy can play a role in this. Um, a final question, which is related to the public outcry. Um, we all heard Greta Thunberg years ago and are more aware of the role that youth activism is playing in, in the crisis of climate change. Um, what do you see the role of youth and younger generations in the global impact? And what do you see in Israel in that sense? Well, very briefly, you know, in, in Europe, the revolutionary plan adopted by Europe called the European Green Deal was only um, the, 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 the only reason that even conservative politicians were uh, able to agree to such, a, to such a, a policy was the pressure of young people. And uh, Greta Thunberg and their friends were responsible for a huge movement back in 2019 that all, uh, uh, you know, pressed European politicians to do the big change. And it is very, very important to see that in Israel we have these developments. You know, today, this um, Knesset um, Environment Day was uh, an, a manifestation of uh, young people, pupils and young students coming to the Knesset and pressing the members of Knesset. And this was very, very influential. I think it is a very, very key um, uh, development in, in our, um, in our uh, overall situation vis-a-vis -vis climate crisis. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jodo, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and your um, intake of what happened in Glasgow and also for everything that you do and continue to do in your respective roles. And good luck with the President's Forum. We'll be following that as well. So thank you. Thank you. I'm now happy. So we're moving to the section of the, of the, the meeting today that will focus on three intersections of climate change with social issues. And our first guest is Dr. Shira Efron from the INSS the Institute for National Studies. She's also a special advisor on Israel with the Rand Corporation and an adjacent scholar at the Modern War Institute at West Point. Um, we're posting her full bio in the chat for those of you who want to follow. As there are many aspects of climate change we don't necessarily stop to think about in our daily life, we've invited Shira to speak about the intersection of climate change with national security. So Shira, thank you for joining us and I'm handing it over to you. Greetings from Tel Aviv. It's so good to be with you. I'm a huge fan of uh, J JFN. Um, and I also see some friends here um, listening, John Fischel, Orni Petrushka and others. So hi, uh, guys. Uh, it's great to be with you here. And it's really hard to follow uh, Dov Hanin, who is really <laughs> one of Israel's leading uh, experts and um, activists and former official that has done so much to advance this issue and so many other issues of social justice. Um, I'll take it in a different direction a little bit um, and I'll explain why. I think that the climate crisis, climate change is a social issue, is an economic issue, is a health issue. It's definitely an environmental issue. But there is, um, at least in a country like Israel, um, that is very scared to its national security, there is an advantage of speaking in security terms about um, uh, the implications for national security of climate change. And I'm talking about national security in the very traditional sense of, uh, th of, way of, of thinking, defense, uh, if you will. I'll share with you a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we'll go through it really briefly and you can interrupt me with questions or I'll be available for questions afterwards. I will tell you uh, that I, um, this, a lot of it is based on uh, research I've done at the RAND Corporation for the Pentagon, uh, for the armed services in the US. And some of it uh, we're hoping to do here in Israel as part of INSS and other hats. Um, Naftali Bennett, the prime minister received the uh, Hebrew version of this, uh, um, of this presentation. And um, I'm happy to say that they've, at least the NSC under him, is, uh, has adopted some of the recommendations, which we'll get into in a second. So I think I should share screen, right? Sorry, how do I do that? So why is climate change uh, a national, even a national security issue? Um, there are three, I guess I would talk about three key themes. First of all, we speak about it in the geostrategic sense of things. We know that climate change, the, the professional term used in the analytical community is a threat multiplier. It makes every problem worse. It aggravates social, uh, economic, uh, and ethnic tensions uh, to the point that it undermines state stability. And we can get into uh, the example of the civil war in Syria that started in large part, now we know in hindsight, um, uh, 
following a, a prolonged drought from 2006 to 2011 that pushed 1.5 million uh, Syrian farmers from rural areas to the cities, exacerbated tensions there, um, led, left people without livelihood and food, and uh, led to the uh, civil war uh, in Syria. By the way, interestingly, the address sort of, the writing was on the wall. We, um, looking back, we see that in the, U the UN had already in 2009 and 2010, a year and two years before the war, warned that Syria was on the verge of a, a total uh, breakdown because of the drought. But of course, no one uh, heeded to the warnings at the time. Uh, it could lead to mass uh, migration. The uh, estimations are that 21.5 20 million climate refugees uh, had to leave their homes in the last decade. Assessments are that this number could get to 500 million. And I've seen an estimate talking about 1 billion people. So it's an eighth of the world's population. Maybe then it's going to be a ninth of the world's population by 2050. These are staggering numbers. Uh, of course, jeopardizes water and food security. Uh, it's associated with infectious disease. We speak about COVID, uh, but if you guys, you all remember Zika, Ebola, those are um, the types of diseases that we know for, for a fact that are associated with climate change there the, and their frequency is gonna just grow uh, with the effect. Um, it's also not just the geostrategic uh, issues, but also it affects, uh, um, which we will see in a moment, it affects the ability of military forces, armed forces to do their basic job, which is defend the homeland. Um, it affects what we would call military buildup, readiness, capabilities, and I'll show you some examples. Um, and it also adds tr stress to the armed forces tasking and missions, because as we've seen also with COVID, um, they would be required to respond to emergencies uh, home, at home also. When we're, lock, we're, we're looking at the Middle East, all these tensions that we speak about, uh, water insecurity, food insecurity, uh, creating uh, conditions that are uh, uh, really uh, that benefit sub-state actors like terrorist organizations, uh, state stability. All these uh, conditions, of course, uh, they, uh, sorry, CBL is writing me. Um, all these things coincide with an environment that is um, anyway really inherently unstable. And the MENA region is really what we call a climatic hotspot. Uh, this estimates, you know, when, when the global leaders are trying to ensure that the global average temperature doesn't uh, rise to more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, in Israel, we're talking about the, the assessments for this region is gonna be uh, four times as much. We're already almost at the 1.5 degrees Celsius here. Um, it's, it's, uh, so the, the effects are already here, just going to get worse. We, we, sorry, we don't have time to get, uh, into every country, but the manifestations in every country are quite different. In Syria, I mentioned the example, Egypt, interesting country to look at, uh, because the rising sea level in the Nile del Delta could jeopardize, um, agriculture, uh, in Egypt, the whole population of Alexandria can be under the risk of uh, flooding. Um, and even uh, the new, um, the melting of the Arctic and opening of a new ocean there can undermine, uh, can, can hurt the in Egyptian income from the Suez Canal trade, which would hurt um, uh, stability there. Uh, Jordan, uh, Dove just spoke about uh, Jordan. Jordan is, I think there are only eight or nine countries in the world with less uh, precipitation than Jordan. Jordan. Jordan is extremely vulnerable. There are opportunities with Israel. It's great that the new government um, has, has resumed uh, transferring money to Jordan. It's necessary, but insufficient. Uh, Iran, a country that Israel is uh, uh, highly concerned about, uh, you could say that uh, the climate change is also an ex existential threat for Iran. Um, and it doesn't only affect these countries. Also Israel's new friends, when we talk about the UAE, uh, there are estimates, uh, MIT studies show that by 2050, this Gulf region could become what we would call unlivable uh, flights. Out, I've been there also studying with their Air Force. Flights are frequently delayed and canceled. They're trying to do a lot of things. They have the means to produce, but the fact is that this remains a very uh, problematic uh, area. Um, when we talk about, I apologize, it's good. Uh, Best way. When we look about it, it also affects military capabilities and readiness. Um, the 
Pentagon, uh, Congress ordered the Pentagon in 2016 to examine uh, 3,500 military installations, major military installation. And the Pentagon came back with an assessment that already half of them, that half of them are already vulnerable uh, to climate change. Different ways, rising sea levels, uh, danger of fire, um, uh, of course, uh, storms uh, and others. Uh, flights are delayed, uh, depart flights are delayed and canceled due to heat waves in uh, many uh, American bases, including in the Middle East, very close to Israel. Um, there are health risks uh, to personnel uh, stemming from heat waves. Uh, this summer was uh, extremely warm in Israel and there were a lot of uh, um, heat strokes among soldiers forcing also the IDF to cancel training days. Um, and there's also a growing need for uh, humanitarian and aid operations. By the way, also the IDF, I don't think the IDF ever thought that what they would need, and by the way, it was supported partially by philanthropy, is a field hospital uh, to assist uh, the fighting, or not the fighting, but the wounded uh, in Syria on the border. And these things take cost a lot of money. So next time when we think about the budget, um, the idea is do we prioritize an F-15 or a military hospital? And I think this is, this is you know, an important question for decision makers. Um, Israel, we, we don't have time to go into this. Um, the US, UK, uh, NATO has been dealing with these issues for many, many years. Uh, there are uh, unclassified files now that show that Nixon started looking at the Arctic uh, as a frontier with the Soviet Union uh, in the 60s. Uh, the CIA has looked at it in the 90s. Um, with, with a variety of commitments and ideas. I will tell you that Israel's conversation on this issue in the military establishment, Israel has come very late to the game. Uh, in July, 2018, Israel established a climate directorate and um, called, and there was a government decision also calling for all uh, bodies in the Israeli government to prepare for climate change. In uh, June 2021, the Knesset Research and Information Center, which is like the Congressional Research Center, published a report basically saying that eh, not much has been done. The Israeli state controller just came out a few weeks ago with a report of 600 something pages saying that really nothing is done and Israel is really behind. Uh, but I will tell you, in September 2021, the IDF decided to uh, build a climate directorate, which is nice. And today, so. I'm sorry, I don't know when you lost me. I will, maybe I'll end with this. We've had several recommendations and they were um, implemented already or at least taken seriously. So I, that's why I'm more optimistic than I've ever been before. Israel is late into the game, uh, very late, uh, at least in the security establishment. And it's something we have to say also, the Pentagon continued during the, the Trump years that uh, ordered federal, federal agency to stop dealing with this issue. The, the Pentagon did continue, but uh, Israel is a small country. <laughs> it's very easy to implement decisions once uh, you have a commander in chief that decides. The prime minister, and I say this as someone, you know, I think I think uh, he takes he understands this is a serious issue. Um, it's not politically controversial here, thank goodness. There's so many issues that are politically controversial, but this is not, and it, this is something that this government that is such a hodgepodge. Yeah. So we apologize for that. It's probably climate change related. I'm I bet. Okay, so we apologize about that and hopefully Shira will be able to get back and then maybe answer a few questions towards the end. So we heard about the aspect of um, national security in, in, related, uh, in relation to climate change. And now we're moving, moving to our third angle of climate change, focusing on the social aspects. And it's my pleasure in this regard to introduce Professor Yusuf Jabalin. Yusuf is an Associate Dean for Research at the Faculty of Agriculture and Town Planning in the Technion. Through his work, Jabarin is promoting a more just and resilient cities and societies. Professor Jabarin served on the New Israel Fund Arab Society's Grants Committee and his full bio is placed in the chat. Yusuf, thanks for joining us today and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll go with my, uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So um, the, the the issue of, uh, uh, of social justice is very critical to understand climate change, and it's also 
critical for each city, any city, to cope with the with climate change. And meanwhile, our major cities around the world are not doing well in this sense. I'm speaking about my research focus focuses on uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, Paris, London, uh, Johannesburg, uh, uh, New Mexico, Eugene. Uh, and so uh, uh, I put many of my thoughts and research in uh, my recent book, uh, with this title, The Risk City, and it's about how cities around the world the global north and global south uh, are uh, coping with climate change. And I established some theories there for cities and practicality in order to cope with this uh, issue. And I found that uh, two things. One thing is that the way we are planning and developing our cities, uh, in fact, the results of this, of the conventional traditional ways since the beginning of modernism till now, we have harassed, destroyed the, 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 the soft social uh, uh, layer of each of our uh, uh, cities, uh, segregation, inequalities, uh, etc., are major features of uh, every single city around the world, mainly in the West. The other thing is that uh, without uh, the major uh, thing is that cities cannot cope with climate change without addressing social issues, mainly, uh, mainly segregation issues, the fair distribution of resources, etc. So I'll give you an example of what happened with the, our lessons from COVID-19. I have written about it, some uh, articles, uh, and uh, we found that uh, we, have anal uh, we have analyzed uh, many uh, large cities uh, around the world, and we find that uh, uh, cities, in fact, failed in coping with the risk of COVID-19 because of their systematic urban policies. It's resulted urban form and structure, and because of their deep inequalities among groups. And we found also in, like, in cities like in New York, in Chicago, uh, I took one uh, big uh, title uh, from uh, uh, New York Times uh, at the very few beginning of the few months of COVID-19, the eruption of uh, COVID-19, and the title said death in New York as a zip code. So why death is as a zip code? Because the city is hugely, is deeply segregated, and we found out that that were minority places, uh, disadvantaged group of people, uh, etc., African American uh, neighborhood, etc. Death there, the, the rate of death was huge compared to other other places. So our uh, our we have some lessons to learn from this, and to compare it, uh, to 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 reflect it on what's going on. Uh, and the cry within the cry of the crowd when, when we meet the crisis of uh, climate change. Uh, and first of all, COVID 19 uh, brought to the fore uh, the issue of social and spatial inequalities because of the death at the zip code and because we failed, cities failed in their adaptability to cope with this thing, COVID 19. And uh, Disadvantaged groups also often suffer more from exposure to risk and economic difficulties due to their pre-existing conditions and limited access to services. We also find it in many, many other places around the world. And we find it also among the Arab minority in Israel. We'll speak at the end about this uh, uh, minority. And the climate change, we suppose it's going to be there uh, to, 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 to strike minorities and groups, disadvantaged groups, uh, uh, disproportionately. Uh, and uh, one of my, my recent research, uh, it is under review now, uh, I have analyzed, make analysis and collected the, the data of all the um, cities around the world with one million uh, residents and more, for all the large cities, the big cities. And I found, I was surprised to find that 
Of course, there is a, the, the rift and the divide south and north, global south, global north divide. The global south is very, very poor and these issues of climate change are not there at all. But even in the West, the, the result shows that most, the vast majority of the cities are doing bad. Most of them have increased the emission. Few of them only just decreased the emission rate. So if we take in New York City, for example, uh, where we, uh, the city has a huge efforts to, to change its climate change and risk, etc. This city have neglected for many years, for more than 200 years, since the very modern, the, the, the modernism, uh, it's neglected the social issues of uh, uh, disparities among uh, groups. And then the, the, the city uh, made all of this within it through the COVID-19. But the city itself has also a lot of many programs to cope with the, uh, with the, with the climate change. Uh, this photo is from Sandy, 2000 in New York City, how the, the, the storm just as NASA said, this is a storm of, this is the, what the first warning maybe to the city from a uh, uh, storm. It's, I think it's uh, Sandy and the city was you know, flooded. And then the city come this big, huge city, the modern city, the city of capitalism said that the city failed to cope with sustainability and climate change for one major reason it is because the city is has about 50 percent of its population under the poverty line the poverty line so the city this most capitalist capitalist city around the world say that we need this is the new plan of new york city to have one new york one plan for a strong and just city and why just city because the city failed in coping with the uh, with sandy and and will fail without addressing the disparities the spatial structure the distribution of resources of health uh, resources etc the city will fail to cope with climate change this has become a fact for this huge city and this is the same with the uh, with london and other uh, other cities so there are four uh, uh, four in my next book will be published in three months, uh, hopefully. Uh, I keep saying this in the last uh, year, that's coming next three months. But it's that the title of the, of the book is The Just Resilient City. My major concern is that without social resilience of cities, these cities will fail to cope with, to, to deal with the climate change and the impact of climate change. So the major uh, issues are the mitigation, uh, in Israel, if we take Israel as a case study, in the sense of mitigation, Israel is not there. It's a very primitive state in the sense of mitigation. In terms, in terms of adaptability, adaptation measures, and to adapt the cities to uh, to, the, to storms, to floods, to uh, high temperatures, etc. The state is not there. The state is very primitive in this sense. The state still think in in the mentality of the modernism, the beginning of the modernism, where the, the, the car is the hero of, the, of, the, of, of modernism and the machine. This is the way of thinking till now, unfortunately, in Israel. The other side is the urban structure. We just build everywhere. The, the state has no, uh, no, no uh, right agenda for uh, compactness, for sustainable development. The idea why this happened in Israel simply because the state wants just to expand everywhere to control the lands. The state of Israel controls today 90, 93% of the, of the land in the state. 93%, 2.3% belong, are owned by Arab municipalities, even though they are 21% of the state. And the, the, the government through its population which called the uh, dispersal population strategy, just built more than 1,060 uh, uh, small villages, mushabim, kibbutzim, whatever, uh, with small, very small densities and reduced differences in the, in the state itself. 
and in this sense, we, when we are speaking about uh, spatial injustice, we found that, according to my research, as we are speaking about justice and spatial justice, I found that in these small villages, the, uh, there is no one, even one Arab family, in 944 uh, Jewish settlements inside Israel, not in the West Bank, uh, but here inside Israel. 940 uh, villages. Imagine that 940 villages, Jewish, Jewish, Jewish communities are not allowed to live in uh, United States in cities or villages with, uh, in this sense. The other thing is the social justice. This is a major issue that we need to address and we are not addressing it also in Israel. I want to go to continue with, I just took this photo. Uh, uh, I took it a few weeks in Jerusalem we have here, this is in Silwan. All what we have, we are seeing here in this photo, it look like slums, very poor communities. All what we are seeing here is informal buildings, what Israel considered as illegal buildings. So with this, this is the major phenomena also among the Islamization of the Arab cities in Israel. This is the process that have been occurring in the last four decades. Now we are reach the, the climax of this process. The vast majority of the Arab cities become slums in terms of poverty and also in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, space, density, etc. And also in terms of violence. Why violence are emerging now? Every minute, killing in, in New York City, we have uh, six, uh, six, six um, people die because of some sort of violence, six persons for 1,100 uh, uh, residents. It happens everywhere in, in our uh, cities, in the Arab cities. So this is in Jerusalem, but also this one, these are informal buildings almost without uh, paved streets, almost with, uh, with neglected area, even the new area in the Arab cities. All of what you see here, this is Umm al Fahim city. All of what we have, all, all of these buildings are illegal. So we have about one, about 50% of the Arabs in Israel live in illegal buildings. So. In this sense, the people who live here, no one think about climate change or sustainability or to separate glasses and uh, paper or whatever. And uh, the people live here simply to protect themselves, to build their houses illegally. This is very dense place. 50%, 52% of the families in this place are under the poverty line. And so we, all of a sudden, if you read about the slums in New York City, in Chicago, in Boston, in London, in the 20s of the, of the previous century, these are the processes that we have here in recent years in Israel. It's a huge neglect. The state is not here. Also, unfortunately, the green organizations and the green environmental organization movement. This movement does not have any sense or agenda about these places. Unfortunately, uh, this organization usually look at the trees and the green spaces and how to mostly uh, even within the legal statutory zoning context, the Green Foundation, the Green Organization in Israel support the government in terms of confiscating land, and planting lands in Arab areas in order to prevent the natural uh, expansion of this city, etc. So the, 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 the environmental organization in Israel missed the point the post-modern, the emerging point of, which suggests that without environmental 
justice, social justice, climate change justice, the entire state cannot move on, cannot move on. And this is, a, a, I will stop here. I think I finished, I took my time. Oh, Gil, yeah, send me. Okay. I just see, saw you uh, mail. Thank you very much. So I will just stop sharing. Thank you very much, Yusuf. There's already a question in the chat that you can also see. Um, yeah, as, as you just answered it as well, but I'll just read it out loud. The kibbutzim claim that their control of the land actually is pro-environmental, de-desertation, less roads, more vegetation. So the social justice is not aligned with climate initiatives, but in conflict with it. Um, yeah. Also says that he couldn't agree more environment and social justice are interdependent. So one question that we have for you here, since many of the funders who care about environmental issues or climate issues are the same funders who already fund social issues and social justice, it's often linked, you know. What do you think in the way that these funders are doing philanthropy, they could do differently to have more attention drawn to the environmental aspects of- uh, I think, I think, um... I will support uh, initiatives, social initiatives uh, that, uh, that uh, change what uh, Dov Hanin said before me, also the, the discourse in the country, uh, the discourse of uh, uh, which is concerned uh, climate change sustainable, and sustainability. And uh, I argue that the, the discourse, the major discourse, the green discourse in Israel has been, uh, uh, in terms of practice, have been uh, standing against social justice for uh, minorities in Israel. This is clear to me, unfortunately. So what I will, uh, I will be happy uh, to have initiatives that uh, the funders uh, support uh, initiatives of which related to social justice uh, in, ter in, in cities uh, in, ter in terms of uh, speciality planning the major issue the state distribute its resources since the state has owned 93 percent of the lands the state is the major player the powerful special territorial agent and developer of the state, of the country. Everything is there with the hands of the, of the state. And the state distribute its lands and resources according to its uh, uh, differentiated uh, agenda. I call it the play of distribution or the, the play of, of difference. The state distribute, distributes uh, differently resources for different groups, so we have, we have in this sense, uh, we have the minority, the Arab minority, which is at the end of this year will be this minority is supposed to be two, two million people, twenty two percent of the state population. So I will support uh, a new agenda to tackle the uh, what's going on in terms of special planning and resources, and also to educate the green environment in Israel, specifically the green in, 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 in a, a movement also. In addition, in addition, I will support in terms of pedagogy, in terms of, I will support in terms of, uh, for educating the entire population uh, and to, to connect, to reconnect these issues of social justice with the environmental, uh, uh, consciousness. So both of them must be uh, there. So we need, I think, we need the uh, we need the support for such uh, for such uh, missions to have new goals for uh, such uh, initiatives, social justice, environmental uh, goals to help communities. Also, uh, we have we have huge sources for. Uh, to have a clean energy, but we don't have it in the Arab uh, sectors. We don't have it at all. 
why not? Why not to have it in this place, which is so hot, etc. So that this so, relates exactly to the final question that we have here in the chat. You can also see it yourself. Would you support uh, Dov Hanin's initiative to solarize the Negev? Yeah, of course. This is, um, you know, before the people were aware of climate change, because there are about, uh, in Israel, there are about 45 Arab unrecognized villages. So in these places, even the cemeteries are not recognized. The people, there is no authority there. There is nothing there but people who are, who have, who, who, whose space is not recognized. It's not formally it's not recognized by the state. And there are about 180,000 people live there. And unfortunately, the violence in recent uh, weeks rise there extremely. I understand it, of course. I, I talk about it five years ago. I anticipated all of these processes among the Arab, the Islamization, because of the special planning policies of the state, which are, which are discriminative. So I, I, I just saw it, anticipated this thing. I think so many people in the, in the, in the Negev, in the Nakab, uh, started to, to use, because they are not connected to the electric uh, uh, network. <laughs> so they started with this thing. I think this is a good idea, uh, a good initiative to just to have it uh, uh, there. I think, I think the, green, the green agenda should be also to put efforts to make the state the government recognize these places, these villages, and to make the policy, to make the policy, the territorial special policies more just. This is the only thing that can help us and cut the process of Islamization and victimization which happened in, this, uh, in these places. Thank you very much. Thank you for the research that you do. It feels like a conversation that definitely needs to be continued. And Thank much you very more much for us. having me. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So with that, we're moving to our final speaker for tonight. Professor Nadav Davidovich, who might, some of you might recognize his name in a minute when you'll see it on the screen. He's been very active and interviewed very, very often regarding COVID in Israel. He's an epidemiologist and public health physician. He's a full professor and chair at the Department of Health Systems at the Ben Gurion University. Nadav recently chaired the Israeli Union for Public Health Physicians and played an important role in shaping Israeli policies during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can again find his full bio in the chat, reminding you you can use the chat to put questions for Nadav. And Nadav is gonna talk about the third intersection of climate change tonight with the health issue in Israel. So Nadav, thanks for joining us. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, Professor Jabarin and I were just today in a meeting we are uh, together on a committee by the Israel Academy of Sciences on uh, climate change. Uh, also very proud uh, that today we were uh, at the parliament. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, there is a new uh, subcommittee on uh, health, environment and climate change going to be headed by uh, my friend, the uh, colleague, Professor Alon Tal. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, things, uh, as Dov Hanin said, uh, always complicated. Uh, there are also good things that are uh, taking place. And of course, uh, we're still in a marathon and uh, many things we need to do. Uh, I think that uh, what I'm going to present, uh, uh, it's not going to be long. Uh, don't be afraid. I know that I'm the last speaker. Uh, are very much connected to, my, to the previous uh, presentations. Um, I'm a public health physician. For me, public health is much broader than just medicine. And uh, I share the vision of social justice that uh, Professor Jabarin uh, was presenting. And um, I think uh, that the main uh, challenge uh, for you uh, and the main challenge uh, that uh, Professor Jabarin was also asked about uh, funding is indeed to see that the things are integrated. Uh, because uh, there was a time that, unfortunately, uh, for example, just to take the question of health and the environment, it looks like they're competing. But uh, I think just the opposite, and this is uh, the, 
maybe one of the main messages I'm going uh, to present. So climate change is here. Um, and we spoke today about a uh, mitigation, but adaptation was also mentioned. And uh, I think that uh, many times it's being neglected uh, in uh, the general discourse and also in Israel. Uh, we see here that premature death from exposure to extreme heat uh, in Israel was uh, by more than 50%. Uh, and of course, this is related to social justice because this is not, uh, you know, like uh, distributed uh, randomly. Uh, it's related to your zip code. It's related to vulnerable uh, uh, groups. Uh, and that's something that we need uh, uh, to remember. Uh, I'm from Ben Gurion University. Uh, I'm the director of the School of Public Health uh, there and the climate change became a very important issue for us already for many years. And you can see here the issue of sandstorm, for example, and air pollution. And uh, this is of course related to chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, asthma, pneumonia, also uh, cardiac uh, events. Uh, and again, uh, you can see the social gradient uh, here because people that are rich, of course, can protect themselves uh, much uh, uh, better. Um, as uh, Sigal mentioned, I'm very much involved in COVID. I'm sitting on the advisory, national advisory committee and also on the international committees. And I think that the COVID maybe can serve for us as a warning sign. Um, how we deal with uh, um, COVID um, on the very narrow perspective many times. Uh, Professor Jabrin also showed us uh, the question of urban planning and its importance for COVID and how it can be related also to climate change. But I think that uh, there's another message here because it's uh, really interesting to see how COVID actually mobilized so many things that we spoke about before, um, especially regarding, for example, about uh, data, usage of data, uh, sharing data, I'm not uh, trying to say that with COVID everything is perfect and there were lots of problems, but I wish that uh, similar things that happened, uh, you know, in the last uh, more than year and a half now uh, could be thought about uh, climate change. Uh, there are recommendations about uh, climate change preparedness, including uh, in health, and almost all of it actually was not, uh, there is no budget for it. Uh, and like uh, was mentioned about the Glasgow uh, uh, conference, you know, lots of blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I hope this will not remain uh, there. So um, I think that COVID uh, is a warning sign. It's a warning sign also about uh, inequalities within countries and between countries. Just think about the question of uh, vaccination. Uh, we need to move from vaccine nationalism to vaccine internationalism. Same thing with uh, climate change and, and uh, health. Um, and as I mentioned, my perception as a public health physician uh, about health, health, unfortunately, many times, both by physicians and the public, stops somewhere here, you know, in lifestyle. And it's very individualized. But health is much broader. It's related to community, social capital, local economy, built environment, natural environment, and in general, the global uh, ecosystem. And all of these are, you know, also related to issues of uh, microeconomy, uh, politics of uh, health, and the determinants of health and well-being are crucial here. We're speaking now about neighborhoods as a, a determinant of health. Uh, so when you're thinking about funding uh, things, uh, are the main uh, projects, you know, taking seriously uh, this approach that we call it sometimes health equity in all policies. Uh, do we really working for integration? And uh, I think that one of the main problems currently that all of us are talking about integration, all of us are talking about health in all policies, but uh, there are so many structural uh, issues and resistance to share data resistance to be interdisciplinary. Even at the university level, we, saw, we see that uh, the department structure many times is uh, uh, um, challenging us uh, really to do inter, uh, to do collaborations and to do interdisciplinary innovative studies. 
Uh, this is true not just in the academia, this is true also within uh, the government work and NGOs. Uh, and I think this is one of the, uh, the, the challenges. And I think that funders can demand uh, from projects to show this real uh, interdisciplinarity and integration, uh, the structural uh, issues that uh, are so uh, important. And, and today we are even moving farther, and this is taken from uh, a, a textbook that I'm teaching from, it's called EcoHealth, uh, the perception uh, about the relationship between ecology and health. And you can see that it's much more dynamic than the previous one. It's about the interaction and dynamics between the natural and anthropogenic. So you can see the decline of natural resources and population growth, things that were mentioned before, like migration, urbanization, economic development, etc. cetera, versus uh, air, land, energy, water, natural disasters, all are very crucial uh, and important uh, when we're talking about uh, public health. Uh, and again, these are not just national problems, uh, these are also global health uh, governance uh, uh, issues. So just take uh, the question of migration uh, that was mentioned uh, uh, before, uh, and uh, before an environmental vulnerability. Uh, migration is one of the determinants of health and it's deeply influenced, going to be even more influenced uh, by climate change. And that's something that uh, all um, health uh, systems must take into consideration, but of course, not just health systems, but uh, other systems as well. So climate migration, uh, you know, it's a huge uh, driver and we're going to see this uh, uh, happening more and more. And Israel, of course, must uh, take it into consideration. And if we think that we can just close our borders, I think this is very naive and simplistic. By the way, this is true also about what's going on in Gaza. Uh, we uh, did some work with, uh, uh, um, with uh, Echo Peace. Uh, about uh, the dangers of uh, uh, thinking on the current situation in Gaza and environmental refugees. And this is from a, a paper we published uh, about uh, the different interaction between the environmental stressors, the different pathways and health outcomes. And again, this is not just random, it's related to a social gradient. Uh, and I think here you can understand how social justice, environmental forces, and, and public health are so linked uh, together. So we have uh, lots of work to do about strengthening health systems. And again, you saw what happened with COVID, uh, how we can do policy-oriented uh, research, uh, how we need to train professionals, including in leadership. Uh, we opened at Ben Gurion University a leadership, a health leadership program, and uh, we're working with the uh, associations of schools of public health in European region. We have a project funded by Erasmus Capacity Building, and we'll be doing a simulation on health leadership, including on climate change uh, um, in the next uh, uh, semester. Of course, uh, lots of research and uh, sharing data, different types of data and presenting them uh, to policymakers. how we need to do a much more coordinated care between hospitals and the community in order to have a much more comprehensive uh, healthcare system, especially if you're going to face environmental uh, refugees and the need for culturally appropriate uh, uh, services. So this is one of the papers we published. Uh, maybe you recognize some of the names. Uh, Hagai Levin replaced me as the uh, chair of the um, uh, Israeli Public Health Physician Association. I'm still chairing the Israeli Public Health Forum. Uh, we are uh, working together with Chaim Vesviva in, on many, many different issues, including in the climate change uh, coalition. And of course, we're going to work with uh, Dr. Dov uh, Hanin. We uh, met with the president, uh, Herzog, uh, and uh, I think this integration is crucial. And you probably recognize here also Maya Negev. She did a PhD with me in Alontal, and I'm very proud of uh, her, her work. And that's a more recent uh, publication just a few months ago how maybe we need to take lessons from COVID-19 uh, in the Middle East uh, to think about a regional approach uh, and transboundary approach to climate change adaptation. And I think here also the, um, the, you know, the philanthropy should think about projects that are uh, transboundary. And uh, this is not so easy, but uh, these are things that uh, uh, we're doing. So just some highlights from this uh, publication. Again, global health knows no political borders, but of course there are political borders and there are 
uh, barriers, and uh, we need to think how we can move forward with the regional collaboration. Uh, we took some of the lessons from COVID-19 and how we can learn in order to be better prepared for climate change impacts, and how stronger economy should take a much uh, a better leading role in developing resilience. Uh, so the regional collaboration here, I think it's a, uh, Sigal is another point, uh, I really want to have it on the agenda. Um, and other things, uh, and I'm close to finish uh, my presentation, is the relationship between social determinants, health inequities, climate change health, and the SDGs. SDGs. You can see how things like poverty, health and well-being, education, gender uh, equity, uh, reducing inequalities, economic, uh, the question of uh, uh, macroeconomic sustainable cities that Professor Jabarin mentioned. Uh, as Dov Hanin said, we can have a win-win situation here, uh, but we need uh, not just to remain on the rhetorical level, but to see what are the actual processes we can do. Uh, this morning, before going to the parliament, we had a meeting of uh, uh, the network of uh, Negev Now, a coalition with uh, uh, the healthy placemaking uh, initiatives that we started at Ben Gurion University School of Public Health uh, about eight years ago. We are working now with uh, uh, both uh, Eshkol Negev Maravin, Mizrahi, the, the East and West uh, and Negev clusters. Uh, and we spoke about uh, the idea of uh, creating a food lab uh, because you know food is so crucial in terms of uh, food security uh, environmental issues such as the uh, food waste, uh, health inequalities, and we need an interdisciplinary approach. And we started already a project with uh, the Israel prison system uh, to think about autonomous cooking and, and many similar uh, things. So to conclude, uh, many diseases uh, are climate sensitive from infectious diseases to <coughs> um, air pollution and um, uh, um, heat waves and all of that. Climate change is going to affect us through multiple pathways. So we need more and more upstream interventions uh, that uh, must be cross-sectoral. The good uh, uh, news here that uh, we can have win-win situation and many of the solutions for mitigation are also good for adaptation. And uh, many of uh, these uh, cross-sectoral work must be built on trust and solidarity. Now solidarity is of course tricky. You cannot just say, okay, let's have solidarity. Uh, solidarity can be also racist if I'm only interested in people that looks like me. Uh, how to push forward and uh, broaden our perception of solidarity, I think it's one of the current uh, challenges. And uh, uh, again, there are many, many lessons uh, that we can take uh, from COVID-19. Uh, many warning signs, including uh, the issue of uh, moving from vaccine nationalism to vaccine internationalism, being uh, interdisciplinary, to take uh, uh, the question of uh, inequities and to take it uh, seriously in a cross-sectoral manner, uh, I think these are some of the challenges we need to uh, face in the, the coming years. At Ben Gurion University, we established a school, a new school for sustainability and climate change. Uh, this is uh, above the different faculties. I'm the representative of the Faculty of Health Sciences as director of the School of Public Health. Uh, and indeed in the Negev, we can have a, many interesting uh, initiatives because of the special characteristics. I work with the Bedouin community. Uh, the question that was uh, asked uh, before uh, about uh, you know, the Bedouin community working on, on uh, uh, sustainable energy. Uh, I think that uh, with the current uh, NGOs and based also on our work with COVID-19, I probably am more optimistic than uh, I was before, but it's our role. It's not deterministic. We are going to determine uh, our future. Thank you. Wow, Nadav, thank you so much. <laughs> this is a very uh, fascinating and inspiring talk. I mean, we've known each other for many years, and I remember when we started working together, just linking the issues of public health and environment, hoping that this link would, would raise awareness and create more activism against environmental pollutants, because if people don't care about the environment, they'll definitely care about their health. And everything globally escalated to this extent of, you know, risk to the mankind, really and it needs to be much more sophisticated and integrated. And I think uh, the fact that you are placed where you are close to policy making and decision makers gives me comfort personally, knowing that you have this 
holistic view of what needs to happen and hopefully that will affect the systems and, and change uh, to happen. So I'm sure we could continue and ask uh, many more questions, but we're running out of time. I need to place an apology on behalf of Shira Efron, um, who apologized her internet collapsed entirely and she couldn't rejoin the call. We'll be sharing her presentation. Um, and if anyone wants to be in touch with her, we'll share her email. And uh, I'm handing it back over to you, Marla, to conclude. Um, well, thank you again uh, to all of our speakers uh, and to Sigal and Gil. And just to also emphasize that, again, our role as the Green Funders Forum is to really increase all of our impact, both as individual philanthropists and as a community. And there's so much to cover in these topics. This is also just addressed in the chat by Jennifer. There's so much to think about in these topics that I know, like for me, it's actually overwhelming and a bit paralysis like a, a bit of paralysis. And that's why we would really um, like to help you find whatever works for you in terms of how to get involved as, as donors and philanthropists. So again, whether it's a major funding stream or whether you just like to find out how you personally can intersect. So we are offering free consultation meetings so that you can kind of jump in and get over or just find out how whatever would work for you. Our next session is in the series of session three. It's, um, I'm not looking at my notes, I believe it's December 16th. Um, and Gail is going to put- It's the, uh, 13, December 13th. Yeah. And putting in the chat again, the registration link. And uh, is Sigal, am I forgetting anything? No, I think, um, I think you covered it all. Um, we recorded this session, we have the previous session, we can share the recordings if you'd like to invite additional colleagues or friends that are from the philanthropic end of the equation to join our next calls, we're, we'll be happy to, to have them join. Put a note here that I agree with in the, in the chat, I just answered the entire note and then noticed it was in Hebrew letters and I don't have time to convert it, but what says here, the challenges are on a national scale. Funders cannot generate enough impact in the reality. Rather, they should invest in pushing the state to do the, the needful. I think you're very, you know, you're right, right on. And I think this is exactly one of the things that the Green Funders Forum can be as a convener of funders who care and are exploring ways to do it together to generate more impact and to strategize about it in Israel, in the US, globally to try to figure it out. Again, as I said in the opening, this is the time to, to do it, to, to do whatever we can individually and jointly to try to make a difference. And uh, just on that personally, I, I personally believe a lot in advocacy and I can, I'll can i be happy to talk to you about strategies uh, for affecting government action as well. Okay, thanks so much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank Good you evening. very much, everyone.